When local growers put great food on Tennessee tables, that's Living Green. Tonight on Live Green Tennessee, we visit Lynn McCoy, who works with injured wildlife. Then we check out sustainable practices at the Chattanooga Airport. And finally, we visit a small batch Chili's farm in East Tennessee. All this and more coming up next on Live Green Tennessee. This program is brought to you in part by Behind every Pick Tennessee Products logo is a Tennessee farmer who brings you fresh, local food grown with the kind of pride that gets handed down through generations. From now through fall, you can find Tennessee fruits and vegetables on farms and at farmers markets near you. Find your Tennessee farmers at picktnproducts.org. What makes our state unique? Find out on the new Tennessee Channel, a statewide initiative by your public television stations. Each program is created in Tennessee, about Tennessee, and broadcast in Tennessee. The Tennessee Channel, Saturdays, 6 to 10 p.m. Eastern, and Sundays, 2 to 6 p.m. Eastern, right here on your public television station. Funding for this program is provided in part by the United States Department of Agriculture, providing leadership on food, agriculture, natural resources, and related issues based on sound public policy and efficient management. Hello, I'm Melinda Kiefer and I'm proud to bring you stories from across our great state on Live Green Tennessee. Most of us have seen injured wildlife by the road or found an orphan baby bird, but didn't know how to help. We meet Lynn McCoy, who does know how to help the animals that people bring to her Jefferson County home. When healed, most are released back to their habitat in forest and field, but a few can no longer survive on their own and become Lynn's educational ambassadors, going on the road with her to meet people of all ages who live listen and learn. I started out when I was helping an animal shelter get started and then um, they called me one day and said that they had a bird down there, an owl, that they couldn't get to eat and I asked them what they were feeding it, and they said bird seed. And I said, owls don't do bird seed, they're meat eaters. And they said, will you come get it and take care of it? And that's what started it. From then on, I got all of the wildlife calls and critters that came in, came to my house for care. I'm officially a home-based independent wildlife rehabilitator. I've been doing this about 40 years. I am permitted by both the state of Tennessee and the federal government, but the feds because I work with migratory birds. Not very many vets are willing to work with wildlife. It's time consuming and there's a whole lot of knowledge there that they have concentrated on their dogs and cats and their normal patients. But I've been very lucky with Dr. Wayne Lilly, who um, I've known for about 20 years now. And so when I have something that needs special care, x-rays or surgery, they go up to Mountain Home. Without my volunteers, there's no way I could do everything that I do. Um, there are not enough hours in the day, there are not enough days in the year to be able to, to cover everything that's needed. And the volunteers will come in, uh, they'll clean cages, they'll feed for me, they run transportation. They're, they're just miracle workers and they're such a support. A typical day would start around five in the morning um, with feedings. Uh, baby birds have to be fed every 20 minutes, dawn to dark. Little baby mammals like squirrels and rabbits and possums every two to three hours round the clock. So you don't get a whole lot of sleep 
when the babies come in. In between times, it's cleaning the cages, making the formulas, making the food, and answering the phone calls that come in with people that have found a critter and need help with it. My friend Sue and I come and take care of all of the animals whenever Lynn and Steve go somewhere for a vacation. So we feed the animals, we check on them, we check on the house take care of things while she's gone. One thing that home-based rehabbers, we were not funded, so we can't just go out and run all over the country and pick up animals, so we do request people to bring them to us. In some cases they can't, and that's when our transport volunteers come in. I went to Wilderness Wildlife Week in Pigeon Forge and met Lynn there, where I got to pet a possum and fell in love. And then shortly after that, my dog chased a possum and she ejected her babies. We found the babies and I called Lynn, brought them to her in a panic. I asked her if I could volunteer and she said she needs a transporter for the Sevier County area. So that's how I became involved with Lynn. This is one of our education ambassador opossums. His name is Rango. Rango's a year and a half old adult male. He's been with us ever since he was the size of your finger. He was one of 13 babies that was rescued from the pouch of a mother that was killed by a car. And he's got some permanent hip damage, either as a result of the accident or from malnourishment being caught in the pouch of the opossum while it was waiting for somebody to be rescued. When I was growing up, I was told not to bother possums or touch possums because they were vicious and they would bite me and they carry rabies. So to be able to pet a possum really changed my world. With the wildlife ambassadors, the whole purpose, and we have to have a special permit for that too, from both the federal and the state in order to keep an animal as a wildlife ambassador. The wildlife ambassadors that I have are the opossums that you met, the red-tailed hawk, lady hawk, two screech owls, cinnamon and buzzsaw, a barred owl, not barn, but barred owl, uh, named Little Dude, and a broad-winged hawk who's a migratory bird. He was hit by a car uh, and can no longer migrate to Central and South America with the rest of them. And then I have my special friend, Pockets the Groundhog. One of the reasons that we need outreach with kids and with grown-ups too, for that matter, is we need to keep that connection that we're all part of, for example, a large tapestry and we're all threads in it. And if we lose that, if we lose that connection, one thread comes loose and everything will unravel. I think one of the things that's important that Lynn shares is what to do when you see an animal that you know is a, a wild animal. That to go and get an adult and not take matters into your own hand. Not to be afraid of them, but not to touch them and to find a parent or an adult to help them with it. And this is a real special time too because most of them haven't had an opportunity before to touch the animals as they go by. And there's a lot of fear there sometimes, but Lynn is very good at explaining and making sure kids know that she's not going to pass around anything or any creature that's going to hurt them. And she teaches them the proper way to touch them and what they should do if they encounter these animals in the wild. As I look back over the past 40 years, I, I have both heartbreak and joy. And I feel like it has opened me up to a world that I only dreamed of as a child. Personally, as far as um, continuing with the wildlife rehab, I'm gonna continue it just as long as I'm physically able to, to give the proper care to the animals. When, when I can't give the proper care to the animals is the time to quit. It's worth every bit of the, the hard work and the, the heartbreak to be able to release an animal, to scamper off into the woods or take off into the sky and go soaring away, um, it opens your heart in a way that nothing else can. For Chattanooga residents who like to travel, the Chattanooga Airport is a less hectic alternative to larger airports. 
But the Chattanooga Airport staff also embrace sustainability at every opportunity, and they're working to secure a bright future for the scenic city's gateway to the world. WTCI's Sean Townley introduces us to Terry Hart, President and CEO of the Chattanooga Airport. Chattanooga Airport is a regional airport situated in the southeastern part of Tennessee. Um, small airport community, however, with service, commercial air service, growth in cargo, growth in our sustainability projects, growth in the general aviation, uh, one that serves its community. We have many sustainable projects going on here at the airport. And like many entities, we start out small. Our maintenance team was involved in many different things like changing light bulbs, new fixtures, and things of that nature. Went out onto the airfield. We were able to place LED lighting on all our taxiway lights out on the airfield. Um, we're not yet to the point where runway lighting has been accepted to be able to use LED lighting. We're still evaluating that, but all of our taxiway lights now are LED, so we're very excited about that. Here in Chattanooga, we have a lot of asphalt. And over time, of over years, uh, with everything, you have to take the asphalt up and put new down. Instead of doing that, we found a very green product that could go down on the asphalt and kind of revitalize that asphalt uh, to bring the binding factors back. So that it was important that we just did not have to pull the asphalt up and haul it out to a landfill. We were very proud of the facility that we're in here now, Wilson Air Center. It was built to LEED standards. As a matter of fact, the terminal received LEED Platinum status, and it is still the only aviation terminal in the world to have platinum status. We're very pleased with that. We, when you look at everything in the building here, obviously from the bamboo ceilings, a very renewable product, um, to the floors, the, the content of the carpet being recycled that, was, that came in to make the carpet, the furniture, um, everything that is in this facility was all, let's say, local or regional, so you don't have to bring it from long distances. It's very important to do that, attaining LEED certification. So all those different type of pieces go into creating LEED. If you look at next door, we had our first phase was a 12,000 square foot hangar and we received LEED Gold on that building, which is very unique. If you look at a hangar, you think of a hangar as a metal box with airplanes in it. It's much more than that. If you look at that, just the front, a glass front, it brings in natural light. The type of lighting system that's in the building, it's quite unique. Uh, the type of heating system that's in the building, all of those are energy efficient type uh, fixtures. So we're very pleased that not just in a terminal building, but also in a hangar that we can also build the lead standards. It's important to us, obviously, to be a good, good tenant in the community. And with that, one project that we did many years ago was to be able to create infrastructure to move stormwater from one side of the airport through the airport to the other side. It was very important that we do that, and we do a lot of good work with that. The additional project that was underway was we had purchased some uh, property along Brainerd Road with the intent of demolition of the buildings as well as creating a grass site. When we found out what the city was doing with the project of trying to um, revitalize the Brainerd area, we wanted to partner with them, so we did. And with such, instead of just tearing down the buildings, we've kind of regraded the land. We're going to put native plants in to create a space that will help the city in the movement of stormwater away from that area. Every air carrier that comes into Chattanooga, their airplanes, when they come in, not only just shut down their main engines, but there's also an auxiliary engine that runs that powers the electrical systems and the air conditioning systems on board the aircraft. So in a means to help the air carriers, we went forward and created a remote means of doing that, where we have ground power units and preconditioned air units hanging from the jet bridges. And with that, when an aircraft comes in, they can shut all their engines down, hook up to a remote, and be able to power the aircraft and produce power and air to the aircraft. The reason that it's important for the airport, the reason we did this project was one for the air carriers. It helped them, one is to, and to reduce their costs, but at the same time for the airport to reduce emissions here at the airport. 
you have those engines running that's producing emissions and we want to make sure that we're doing everything possible that we do things in a very sustainable manner and that was one of the reasons why we went forward with the project. Solar energy, we were very excited about becoming a part of that and our goals were threefold. One is what could we do to help improve the environment? What could we do to improve our bottom line as a result of doing this project? And most importantly, we want to look at how do we educate the public on all the good things about solar energy and sustainability. So our first, our first phase was a one megawatt solar farm on the south side of our airfield. Uh, that has been in place for approximately two years now, up and running, uh, well ahead of what our projections was. We were very pleased with that. As a result, we moved forward with phase two, which was the second phase of a second megawatt. So we now have two megawatts of power being produced. Again, well ahead of projections. We're very pleased with that. And the important part about that too, education. We also have means of uh, educating the public on the importance of sustainability. We have a kiosk in the commercial terminal that really depicts what is all about solar, how's the farm responding, how does it produce. Uh, in addition, we have a link onto our website that also describes the same information. So we're very pleased about educating the people. And, it's been a very good win-win. Uh, obviously, our agreement with TVA to sell the power back uh, only helps everyone that uses the airfield because the money that we receive, the revenue that comes in as a result of that is there to reduce our cost on the airfield, which is good for everyone. Our two megawatt solar farm currently produces 85% of the power that the airport authority uses. We have an internal goal, how do we get to being self-sufficient, carbon neutral? Uh, we're working on those plans. We need an additional 15% to get there. We're very confident we can get there. It may take us a little bit of time, but we want to be the first airport in the country to say that we're self-sufficient and carbon neutral. Jim Smith started out on a farm in Tennessee, and that is exactly where he ended up decades later. Jim's passion is Rushy Springs Farm, and this Talbot operation produces some of the finest chilies in the southeast. From this crop, Jim creates small batch, salt brined, fermented hot pepper sauces. Everything in my life's been a transition. There's never, the, the only official retirement I've had is that when I came back to Tennessee from New Mexico in 2003, I worked as a, a consumer safety officer for the USDA inspecting chickens. And I, so I technically retired after six and a half years with the USDA. I started out my life in South Pittsburgh, Tennessee, living with my parents and grandparents. Um, so I've been gardening and farming since I could walk, really. My family's been involved in gardening and agriculture for generations, I guess, if not forever. My family moved to Roan County when I was nine years old, and a few years after that, my father bought a farm, which eventually became a Great A dairy. Because of, uh, of pressure of the system, um, I felt the, the necessity to go to college. I uh, was working with uh, Senator Al Gore Sr. Uh, there was a spot at the U U.S. Merchant Marine Academy that he would gladly give me if I was interested. Since I'd kind of had a dream to run away and travel the world on a tramp steamer all my life, that seemed to be pretty cool to me, and I took it. I left sailing and uh, uh, started working on a career in New York uh, as a photographic fine artist and uh, investigative and photographic journalist, uh, which I uh, continued for about 25 years. Um, all the while being involved in gardening as much as possible. I think that it was a more severe psychological blow to me leaving the farm than I realized until I was in my 40s or 50s. When I came back to Tennessee from New Mexico, I had in mind the goal of starting this farm. I made the big jump at that point into doing full-time agriculture uh, as my primary income. Primarily at this time, I grow mostly chilies. Uh, 
If I had my way, I would be as diversified as absolutely possible. But financially, the pressure and the lack of help have, have narrowed my growing down almost exclusively to chilies at this point. The season starts with the year. I start planting chili seed in January in order to have reasonably large chili plants to transplant out as soon as uh, danger of frost uh, goes. Another aspect of it never ends. My Tennessee cherry chili will not grow true from seed. All of the plants that I have are clones and I have them um, in hoop houses so that I can protect them uh, from the environment during the winter and keep them growing. I have uh, one bed that's three years old, one bed that's two years old, and two plants that are six years old. So it's, it's really a year-round process. It, it just never ends. That, that's my motto, in fact, it never ends. I generally grow between 20 and 30 varieties of chilies. The most important to me at this time are four that are exclusive to me, Tennessee Cherry Chili, Tennessee Cherry Chili Junior, Ahi Canario, and Ahi Tennessee. I've spent a lot of time researching, looking for chilies, particularly for their flavor. Have quite a few from South America, quite a few from Trinidad. I also grow Tabascos, several varieties of habanero other than the scorpion, the, the boot jalokia, which is the previous world record heat holding chili, peach habanero, um, ahi dulce, which is a habanero with no heat, Sichuan. Predominantly, I think that's it this year. I market gardened in, in the 80s off of my family's farm and I got very involved in growing a large variety of chilies at that time. And I sort of uh, repeated that here. I developed other means of preserving the chilies in order to extend my season. Uh, that got me involved in making chili sauces. And making chili sauces got me involved in salt brine fermentation chili sauces, which uh, was a discovery that I wish I had made when I was a child. I think that they are one of the most valuable foods on the face of the earth. I'll start out with about three quarters of a jar full of loosely packed chilies. And then I make a salt brine out of unrefined sea salt and a late season sweet Riesling wine. I add the brine up to about 80% of the level of the chilies because the chilies will make some of their own liquid. In a day or two, the liquid level will be to the point where you can push down all of the chilies and have them basically submerged in the brine. In the beginning, the buoyancy of the chilies combined with gases that are being produced will make the chilies float, so you've got to be on key uh, pushing them down a couple of times a day. As they begin to deteriorate, they will uh, lose their ability to hold air and they also begin to match the specific gravity of the salt brine so they don't have the tendency to float so much anymore. At that point, I will start adding increments of chilies until I have the jar pretty close to full. Then it's just a matter of maintaining it for six to eight weeks or even longer if preferred. Any time after that, it can be pulled off. And the, the process goes from there through separating the skin and the seed and uh, diluting uh, with two parts uh, organic brown rice vinegar. I'd say 98% of my market is the Market Square Farmer's Market in Knoxville. There are a few retail outlets that carry it at this point and a growing number of restaurants in Knoxville. Um, I also have a website and maybe once a week or something I make a sale on that as well and it can be anywhere from California to Switzerland. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Live Green Tennessee, where we take you all across the state into the farms and businesses of those who are making the move to eating fresh, living sustainably, and helping us all be more organic in our thinking and the way we live our lives as Tennesseans. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time on Live Green Tennessee. 
If you would like more information about Live Green Tennessee, please visit our website at livegreentv.org, where you can find everything from healthy recipes to past episodes and more. This program is brought to you in part by... Behind every Pick Tennessee Products logo is a Tennessee farmer who brings you fresh, local food grown with the kind of pride that gets handed down through generations. From now through fall, you can find Tennessee fruits and vegetables on farms and at farmers markets near you. Find your Tennessee farmers at picktnproducts.org. What makes our state unique? Find out on the new Tennessee Channel, a statewide initiative by your public television stations. Each program is created in Tennessee, about Tennessee, and broadcast in Tennessee. The Tennessee Channel, Saturdays, 6 to 10 p.m. Eastern, and Sundays, 2 to 6 p.m. Eastern, right here on your public television station. Funding for this program is provided in part by the United States Department of Agriculture, providing leadership on food, agriculture, natural resources, and related issues based on sound public policy and efficient management. <laughs>